Hope everybody is doing well. Welcome to webinar two, navigating the legislative process. And um, just to keep in mind, anytime that you're advocating for uh, anything equity involved, social justice oriented, there is a legislative process that you have to go through. So one of the things that a mentor told me was in order to play the game, you have to uh, know the game. And the first part of knowing the game is knowing the rules and how the game is actually set up. So when you look through this as a legislative process, you know, uh, don't necessarily think of it as this like strenuous uh, thing that you have to have memorized, but, you know, think of it as like a board game and you have to use strategy to kind of get through each piece of the board. Uh, with that being said, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Maurice Richardson. I am a health policy and management graduate student at UC Berkeley. A little bit about my background, I previously lobbied for the California Hospital Association for about two years and I'll go more into uh, what association looks like or what they do. And before that I actually spent a year as an assembly fellow where I was a legislative staffer for Assemblymember Holden and um, I focused on housing, public safety and business and professions committee which are policy committees that I'll give you a little bit more background about later on. So I want to start off by talking about Cal IHEA's priority areas. And anytime you're advocating, you're usually trying to push forward a mission or um, some type of goal. And you can think of these as uh, not only the organization's goals, but think of them as your goals as well, too. So when you're talking to a legislator, talking to a staffer, you're able to uh, have these goals and these priorities in mind. So at least they know, OK, who is this person representing? And what we represent is building a workforce for health equity, uh, improving health access for all immigrants, advancing universal health insurance, and also addressing social determinants of health through cost sector collaboration. Next, in this slide, we'll see a little bit about the critical steps in the legislative process. Now, the legislative process, think of it as like a monopoly board game. So it isn't necessarily this one-way roadmap where it just goes through one by one. Sometimes you go from A to B to C, and then you have to go back to A and then back to C all over again. So think about this as just the critical steps that can go either way. And usually it starts off by somebody has an idea. Somebody has an idea and they want to be able to expand, let's say, access to mental health services. So you start off with this idea. It goes into the legislative council and then they write it into uh, what we call legal format of a law. And then from there, you introduce it to the front desk on the floor and then they turn it into a bill number, which would have A, B or S, B. A, B standing for assembly bill. S, B is standing for Senate bill which of course uh, designates which house is it at or which house is at the origin. Then it goes through what we call policy committees of the house of origin. So it can have assembly, it has to go through the assembly committees and it has to go through the senate policy committees as well. Once it goes through a policy committee, it goes to the house of origin's fiscal committee. committee. That committee is the Appropriations Committee, which we can talk a little bit more about later. And then from the Fiscal Committee, there's a deadline where all fiscal bills have to be released. Once those fiscal bills are released, it is like the floodgates have opened and then now it can go and be voted for on the floor. From there, it goes to the House, a different House, which would be the Senate or the second House. And then if it goes through that same exact process again, then it goes back to the House of Origin for what we call concurrence, where everybody has to vote on the bill again. You may ask, why would you vote on the bill when we voted on it already? That is because through the legislative process, there are multiple amendments that take place. An amendment is just a simple term that means change in the bill. You might change the amendment from uh, should to can, you can amend the bill to make it like a mandatory requirement, or you can make the bill something that suggests, hey, this is what this agency or this, uh, this person should be doing under the California law. From concurrence, it goes over to the governor's house. Once the governor signs that bill, it actually goes into law. Or the governor can decide to veto the bill. Another way the governor can veto the bill is just by not signing it by the deadline. That's just a 
very high level overview of the legislative process. If you go over to slide five, you can kind of see a more detailed example of the life cycle of a legislation from idea into law. But just for the sake of time, we won't go over that in this sect. Now that you know a little bit about um, the legislative process, this is more of the fun part is who are the players? The players is any a uh, person or industry association that has the ability to have an influence on the legislative process. So even you are a player, you're a player as a constituent and you are also a player as an advocate. Uh, so going down the list, you have policy committees. These policy committees, again, are broken into different subjects. There's one on each side of the house. You have the Assembly Public Safety Committee, and then you have the Senate Public Safety Committee. It's also good to know um, who the consultants are in these committees. A lot of times when it's the House is ran by Democrats, then usually the committees are a little bit more on the progressive side. Uh, some are more progressive than others. Um, the Senate uh, Public Safety Committee, usually a lot of progressive criminal justice reforms passes through that. Uh, an example of the Assembly Health Committee and then you have the Senate Health Committee. Both committees are fairly progressive and you also have the chair who is usually a Democrat or the political party that is in uh, dominance at that time. And then you have the vice chair. The vice chair is going to be Republican. And then the consultants, you have the chief consultant, and then you have the other consultants who have the different issue areas. So you'll have the health committee, but the consultant may focus more on um, insurance, and another consultant may focus more on behavioral health. And then on these policy committees, you'll have legislators. So each policy committee is made up of, let's say, five to six legislators, sometimes even as much as 12 legislators. The budget committee is another committee that is broken into different subject areas. So you have the budget committee on health, you have the budget committee on public safety, but then you also have the overall Senate and Assembly budget committee. The uh, subcommittees, which is the health and public safety and so on uh, budget committees, all create this document of what they want to see in the governor's budget and then that goes to the overall budget committee and then the chair of the assembly budget committee and then the chair of the senate budget committee will meet with the speaker of the house and the senate pro tem of the house which are the two leaders in those separate houses and then they will meet together and then discuss what does the legislature want in the uh, governor's budget and then they sort of negotiate back and forth with the governor's office about what can they get and what can they not get within the governor's budget that comes out and you to get that budget i think every april or may um then you also have select committees the select committees don't really have legislative power as far as passing a law but strategically, you can always use a select committee um, to sort of get information out, to get research, uh, to get the ears of certain legislators. And then sometimes if you can use a select committee properly, like let's say when there was a select committee for the boys and men of color, there was a huge push for bail reform. From that select committee, the bail reform was actually a major topic that following year. And then California actually passed the bail reform law. So select committees, even though they don't have the power to pass a law, they are still potential strategic motivations to have an influence within a given select committee. Then you have lobbyists. Lobbyists usually are, the term lobbyist and advocate is really the same thing, but usually lobbyists, when you hear somebody say lobbyist, they're representing an association. The association is the political arm of the industry. So everybody that you think of has an association. So look down right now and look at the shoes that you're wearing. Yes, that shoe has an association. The uh, candy that you eat has an association. If you're drinking on a Coca-Cola right now, there is a Coca-Cola association. There is a beverage association. If you look back and then look at what's in Coca-Cola, sugar, there's a sugar association as well. So like I said, I worked for the California Hospital Association which represent the hospitals in California. So the associations represent industries. You also have unions that represent um, the workers. So you'll have the teachers union and then they'll have lobbyists as well. Then you also have advocates, people who represent uh, community-based organizations. One, uh, uh, one 
policy advocate that you should also look into is Western Center of Poverty and Law. Uh, also, uh, CPEN, which stands for California Pan uh, Ethnic Health Network. So those are just to give you a little bit of taste of uh, the lobbyists and the advocates that also play a role in influence policy. Then you have staffers. Staffers is another important be, uh, important role because the staffers are the key to the assembly members and the senators. The staffers are the people who uh, basically look over the senator and assembly members' legislative priorities. They're the ones that take the bills and walk them through the legislative process. And most importantly, they're the ones that have influence and tell the legislature uh, tell the legislator what how they should vote on certain bills. So, for instance, when I was a staffer, I had staffed over the housing bills, and I, my job was to analyze the housing bills that was going through the housing committee or going to the floor. And then I was to brief the member and tell him about each and every single bill that was of importance. And from that, I was able to flag, oh, this bill you may need to stay off on. This bill you might need to vote no. Oh, this bill you need to vote yes on. And even sometimes the staffer has the ability to advocate if the member should actually stand up and speak on a bill. So I say this to say the staffer has a very dynamic role. They're not just... Um, their job, they go well above their job duties. So when you look at a staffer and you meet a staffer, it is so important to build those relationships and have that influences on them because usually you won't really meet an assembly member or a senator face to face. You're usually meeting with the staffers. And then I also wanted to give a special shout out to the schedulers because you will not get a meeting with any legislator or staffer without the help of the scheduler. The scheduler is really what we call called the gateway to the office. So the scheduler can put you in contact with the district, the scheduler can put you in contact with the assembly member, the senator, they control everyone's schedule and can tell you who's available and who's not available, but they also have the information on who is the right person for you to talk to. So when you go in and you meet, always show the scheduler some love. They are your best friend. And if they're not your best friend, it's in your interest to make them your best friend. Also, you then have the governor's office and state agencies. The relationship there is the governor has consultants within the governor's office and different cabinet members and secretary members. From there, the governor's office is in constant communication with the agencies. The agencies do not speak directly to the legislator. So the governor's role is sort of to be the leader, but also the protector of the state agencies. Also, the governor's role is to control the purse, control the budget, and then they do that through having constant communication with the state agencies. This is a great thing because when you pass a bill or if you're trying to influence a bill, the first thing the governor's office does after speaking to you as an advocate is talk to the state agency and say, hey, is this really a problem? Is this something that we can uh, solve? Or is it something that we need to put off? They really kind of control what happens after when it comes to implementing the policy. Now, one of the things that I also wanted to put on your radar is the five P's. And this is the most important thing that you need to know when walking around the Capitol or when advocating. And this is with any type of subject area, no matter where you're at. The five P's are policy, people, press, and politics. And the sixth P would be persistence. So... One of the things that you really want to pay attention to, the most important P here, is the people. You really can't get anything done without the people, but also you need to understand that you can have a sound policy, but a sound policy can sort of um, reach barriers to politics. But these are all barriers that you can easily, or sometimes with persistence, which is an important 6P, you can uh, overcome. So next... Uh, we want to focus on preparing to advocate. So the first step is you have to know your audience. You have to know who is in front of you. So the focus is get to know your legislator. Get to know your legislator. Get to know your legislator. I say it three times because that is the most important thing. You do not want to talk about public safety to a legislator who has no interest and doesn't even sit on a public safety committee. 
So you really want to be able to come in professional and know a little bit about who you're speaking to, know their personality, know their priorities. Are they more focused on health care reform? If so, are they more focused on health insurance? Are they an advocate of uh, health equity? Uh, which part of the health care atmosphere do they um, see themselves more comfortable? Know the district strength and weaknesses as well. Is the district majority uh, Democrat? Is it a safe seat or is it a is it a blend? Is it a seat that the member has to uh, the member has to pay close attention to what he does, what he or she does politically? What motivates that uh, legislator? Is it a motivation for this legislator to be known as the uh, champion for health care reform? What is some of the ambitions? All of these things inform your strategy and how you deliver your message. Uh, that also goes into who's the best messenger. Sometimes the best messenger is a lobbyist. Sometimes the best messenger is a constituent. Sometimes the best messenger is a union. That all depends on who is your legislature. So you can do uh, things as far as look into um, who sponsors most of the legislators' bill package. Maybe they have close relationships with SEIU, which is a union. Maybe they have close relationships with Western Center of Law and Poverty. So you can always go through that by looking at legeinfo.ca.gov, and you can actually go, and which we'll show you later on. But um, sometimes the best messenger, if you're advocating for education reform, is a student. Maybe you talking to the legislator as a student or you bringing in a student. So these are different strategies, different ways to choose the messenger that is best fit for the given office visit. Um, but most importantly, you need to know and plan how do you want to communicate. I say recognize that you are the professor. The reason why I say that you are the professor is because you have the power, you hold this information. You hold this information in a sense of you have to assume that the person that you're talking to knows nothing about what you are talking about, even if it may be blatantly uh, obvious. So you may be speaking about having community health workers and um, how this can be used to, to really help bring job growth in you know, communities of color, but also improve um, health care delivery in communities of color. But you have to assume that the person in front of you knows nothing because why? You control all the information. So you need to have some facts ready at hand. You need to be able to have an oral story, be able to uh, watch out for your tone, be able to have some type of appeal in your story. Uh, maybe the legislator has experience with having a, a grandmother that's on dialysis. Maybe some type of story that appeals to that could also be of, um, could help. If it, but don't make up a story only if it's a true story, you know. But also uh, time management. The oral story, sometimes you can have a long, overdrawn story, but you really want to focus on the key points of the story that is important for your advocacy. And you want to make sure that if you have only 20 minutes of this uh, legislator or staffer's time, that you don't want to spend, you know, time like 40 minutes talking about a story of what happened to uh, this person and that person. Another way to communicate is just having a policy report at hand. It's not. Uh, it's actually very beneficial if there's a policy report around bail reform that is like published, and you can actually bring that policy report to the staffer. A lot of times, the staffer says, "Okay, well, this person, you know, done their research, but also here goes some objective facts that I can look at and present to my member." One of the most common ways that you'll see these things communicated is through a fact sheet or an advocacy letter, which we'll go in more detail about just a little bit later in this um, webinar. So how to tell a story, it starts off with the bare basics of the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, be prepared to talk about who supports the bill. Maybe there's certain groups that the legislator may care more about. Maybe they care more about um, unions. Maybe they care more about SCIU. Maybe they care more about what CPEN thinks. So again, that kind of goes right back to what I was saying earlier as far as knowing your legislator. And sometimes the the staffer may give you a little hint, ask about certain organizations, and that's just sort of give you a, a, a little bit of insight into like what this author I mean, or legislator is actually looking for. Uh, no, again, the overall goal is to communicate the purpose. Build a sense of urgency into your narrative. I'm not telling you to 
fabricate anything because that's one thing that we're not doing as an advocate. As far as an advocate, you have to be able to build trust and you build trust with the truth. But build a sense of urgency into the narrative and sense of letting this legislator know, like, this needs to be dealt with today. This We have to do something about this now, not next year, not in the next 20 years. We need to address this situation now. And weave in what you know about your audience into that. Like I said earlier, if you know that they uh, want to be the next champion of health care reform with insurance, then maybe if your story has some sort of uh, input on insurance, you build that into your narrative as well. And here we'll go over some examples of um, how to read over a bill, looking at the bill analysis, and how to look at a fact sheet, and also um, how to look at a support letter. And we'll go over that when we actually go over some of those documents to show you as an example. And we'll also email you these examples as well, just to uh, help you out with the last activity. So here, I wanna show you how do you find a bill. And this ledgeinfo.legislature.ca.gov, uh, you could literally get a lot of good information on here. But for right now, we're gonna teach you how to find a bill and then find the uh, bill analysis. So let's say you wanna look at Assemblymember Gonzalez and you wanna see what bill is she working on this year. So you type in the bill number, click go. Oh, so this is actually an assembly member holding bill. And you can go to bill analysis. Oh, they already announced. Okay, wow, this is very quick. I'm sorry, it caught me by surprise. So let's say you wanna look at um, this bill analysis. So you go to AB1608, Community Care Facilities Criminal Background Checks. And if you want to know a little bit about the bill or the code numbers, then you can read this. But usually this will give you the very uh, bare basis of what the bill does. And then you can read this as well. And it always will start off with this bill would require the department to post information or establish a process of a grant simplified and it goes on and on. So within the first two paragraphs, you'll know what the bill does. When you see something that is highlighted or um, a different font color, that is an amendment. So the blue is when something has been added and the red is when something has been taken out. This is good to know because you can see, okay, well, why was this taken out or why was this added? And that kind of goes into a little bit about some things that you will talk about during your um, advoc uh, advocacy visit. And if you want to know how the votes went, you can go here, see if it passed or not. You can go there, see what committees it went through. And then you could also go to the bill analysis. Now, the bill analysis is one of the most important things that you will read when constructing your fact sheet or advocacy letter. Um, and you'll also get a glimpse of who supports the bill, who doesn't support the bill. So you'll click Assembly Human Services and then see what they have to say about the bill. Now, I click this to show you how to read a bill analysis. Some bill analysis can be 20 pages long. When you see all these different uh, code sections, it seems overwhelming. I'm here to teach you how to read a bill analysis and uh, to inform your advocacy. First thing you need to know is the subject. Know the subject, know the author, know when was the last time it was amended. All of this is at the top of the page. Then you should read the summary. The summary will be able to tell you a very high level of what the bill does and the purpose of the bill. From there, I want you to skip down, do what we all know how to do in um, undergrad, skip what existing law is, skip all of this because this is really a lot more technical than what you really need to know as far as uh, what you're advocating for. Unless you're a lawyer and you really need to know the law word for word. Go all the way down and then you'll see comments. The comment section is the most important section. So again, the way I was taught to read a bill analysis, you sort of start with the summary, get the basic information, and then go down to the comments, and then that's when you will learn about the meat of the bill, why the bill will work, why the bill would not work. So it also is organized very well, and who writes this bill analysis? the consultant that you would talk to writes the bill analysis. So remember when I talked about players earlier, I said the consultant is one of the most important players as well. 
The reason why, if you have a bill, the consultant can write about how uh, great this bill is, about how this bill could could um, really make a strong impact. And the consultant does this based off the information that you provide and the information that uh, you share with that consultant. So they are very important players because this is what the staffers read and this is the only document that is 100% objective. So you go through this and you read the comments, the comments to tell you everything that you need to know about the bill. It'll tell you a little bit about the history of the bill. And if you want to, and then it has a need for this bill. This right here will tell you a little bit about um, why the bill is important. What's the purpose of the bill? What's the impact? Then you have the staff comments and the staff comments is uh, more so coming from the office itself. So here you can learn more about the ambitions of the office. What are the goals of the office? Does the bill um, correlate with the office goals? Does it do what it actually says it does? You read all of this in the comments. And then usually here you will see where the bill was amended and these are recommended committee amendments. Usually these are amendments that are suggested from the consultant that usually gets these amendments from different players like the people who are impacted or the industry that's impacted. From there, it kind of sort of helps scope the bill a little bit better, helps shape it. Usually committee amendments are accepted and then the author accepts these amendments and then the bill is amended to be reflected in the law. And then if you want to know any bills that were uh, previously um, passed or not passed, that can give you a history lesson here under related and prior legislation. Also important to know is who supports the bill and who opposes the bill. When you go all the way to the bottom, you'll see the support and opposition. No opposition on foul is one of the best things that you can see sometimes. And then you also want to know who's the sponsor of the bill. Having the sponsor of the bill can let you know who you may need to talk to, who you may need to collaborate with for the current uh, advocacy efforts or future advocacy efforts. And then important, you also need to know who is the consultant and then how could you get in contact with that consultant for um, anything that you may need to know or any information that you may want to share. So that right there is how you would read a bill analysis. Okay, so quickly here is your typical support letter. Um, I'm going to go over this very briefly in a high level fashion. So. In a support letter, usually you have your um, your organization right here at the top. You can see it right here. You have the date. Make sure it is up to date. This is actually like a minor detail that some people don't pay attention to, but I really want to stress that you put the right date on here. So the reason why is because you want to make sure it is the most up to date version of the bill that you are supporting. Sometimes an amendment goes through and you're like, oh, I still want to support this bill. They need to know that by looking at the date. Sometimes people pull off. So the date is actually, even though it's a minor detail, you need to make sure your support letters are up to date. Here you will see who it is addressed to and then right here it says regarding RE capital letters and then you will put the bill number and then the subject and then write right here in brackets if it is support or oppose. Then you'll start it off by uh, quickly saying on behalf of whatever organization that you are representing you are writing in strong support and then you um, you also have to state what a committee that you're writing to, and then you would also state a quick one sentence of what the bill does. You don't need to go into detail or write a dissertation about what the bill does. The second paragraph, you will focus more on who are you? What is your organization? What does your organization stand for? So the reader, the whether it is the consultant, whether it is the legislator, or whether it's the um, governor's office, they want to be able to know, okay, this person supports, but like, who are they? Why do they support? Give them an understanding of who this letter is representing. Next, in the third paragraph, you kind of start giving out a little bit of facts about the problem, right? So here you see there are nearly 8 million people living with criminal records. Many formerly incarcerated people struggle to find a permanent and stable employment after contact 
with the criminal justice system, this is kind of already sort of telling you, okay, this is the problem. We're setting it up, giving some facts about what the problem is, and uh, also is providing context to what the bill is trying to solve, because what are we trying to do here? Let these uh, people who are formerly incarcerated have the ability to become a caregiver, right? So then you see data has shown that employment is the single most important factor to reducing recidivism. Here you see the subscript and you see that there is a study that is being referenced. In each letter, you want to have at least one fact, at least one fact. Usually I want to say two, but you need to have at least one fact. And citing a study is usually the most effective way. Then the fourth paragraph, you sort of talk a little bit about, um, you give a little bit about how, what is the current practice uh, and then the third or the last couple of paragraphs, you go in to talk about how the bill could have an impact and what the bill does to have that impact. Important, the last paragraph, you want to be able to uh, explicitly say, for the reasons above, my organization urges you to support AB 1608 or whatever bill that it is you support. And then you want to sign it and then send it off. So that is the basic contents of a support letter. Again, you will have this in your email as an example to read and use as a template. All right. So now you have the tools that are used in advocacy. You have, you know, the players. Now you kind of want to go through like, what does a simple day in the life of an advocate look like? A day in the life of an advocate looks like, you know, you wake up, drink some tea, maybe coffee. I'm a tea person. And then you go over and you read the news, you know, be well informed. But after you do that, that's like the warm up. You want to meet with your team and then prepare statements, knowing your audience. OK, uh, John may talk about um, this. Sarah may talk about um what the impact is and you know Susie may talk about what is her personal experience with this bill so you know not to say like that's the like the actual structure that you have to use but you just want to know you know what is the role you know uh if if Trey is the person who's supposed to introduce people like everybody needs to know their role is just so it's not that people are left out or you have too many people trying to speak at once then you also want to agree on the end goal of the meeting. What is the purpose? If the purpose is to simply get this member to vote yes on the bill and that's the end goal, then cool. But we need to know what is the purpose of the end goal of this meeting. When you walk in, you will talk to the scheduler. The scheduler will say, oh, um, this person is available. This person is not available. But for the most likely, you'll hear them say, oh, this person is available. Uh, but please wait about like five minutes. Sometimes they're closing out on a meeting. The meeting may, may be running late. Sometimes people get pulled in. They have to talk to the member really fast. So please don't take offense if you're waiting for 10 to 15 minutes. But also you want to be there five minutes early because sometimes people are available early or sometimes meetings get cut short. So you really want to make sure you use your time wisely and get straight to the point. Most importantly, introduce yourself at the beginning of the meeting. The person needs to, the staffer or the legislator needs to know who are they talking to. What organization are you representing? That way you make a good impact and a good um, imprint or uh, impression then now not only do uh, does your issue get heard, but your organization is now becoming more reputable. The relationship is building. You're a familiar face. Your organization is familiar. And then now the meetings become a little bit more warm and you can uh, get your point across uh, more concisely and more effectively. Uh, you don't have to always go through the whole warming up, getting to know you stage. At the end of it, you usually want to exchange business cards. It's understandable if you don't have a business card. So what you want to do is collect the business card of the person in the meeting. If the person in the meeting doesn't cover your issue area, then collect the business card of the person who handles that issue area. And from there, you want to make sure you follow up. Although they don't really focus on this, this follow-up is the most important part because the follow-up can help you keep track of a vote count. Let's say the bill needs 41 votes and they're two votes shy. Well, if you keep track of that, you might be able to say, oh, okay, well, I talked to this person. Oh, this person actually voted yes, so up oh, there goes the 41 votes. 
Um, you also want to be able to send a thank you email again. Politics and working in politics is all about building relationships. Sending a thank you email can really go a long way because a lot of people just take up time and they may not say anything. So send a thank you email, but also inform them what's going on. If there's a change, if there's something that happened in the bill that you love or don't like or you want to see in the bill, people really don't like surprises in this uh, field. So it is best to send that in the email and say, OK, well, this is something that we're looking for. And, you know, make sure you keep everybody in the loop, the staffer, the consultant, the sponsor, keep everybody in the loop so nobody's really surprised and you're able to uh, make your purpose and your stance well known to everybody and all the players. We've been talking for about 30 minutes now and it's about time to wrap this up with some final basic tips. You want to be patient and be prepared to wait. There's nothing worse than somebody just coming into an office and acting like they deserve a meeting right then and now. Uh, be patient, be prepared to wait, contact the scheduler in advance to book an appointment. It's not always necessary because you can do a walk-in, but having an appointment is usually so you don't waste your time. But even if you do have an appointment, like I said, sometimes staffers get pulled into different meetings. So um, be prepared to wait even if you do have an appointment. Now, you heard me throughout this conversation, and I've said uh, things like spot bill, uh, consent calendar, uh, policy committee, fiscal committee, having a bill held. All these different things is just terminology, and it takes time. It's almost like learning another language. So don't be... Um, don't be overwhelmed. Don't stress about if you hear something and you don't know what it is. One thing that I've been told that I truly believe is there is no such thing as a dumb question. If the staffer or anybody says a word or a phrase that you're not too familiar with, don't be afraid to just ask because sometimes it becomes such a language to us that when we talk about it and say it, we're just assuming that the person in front of us knows what it is. So take time to learn the terminology. Um, there's some links that you can look up or just Google. Also, most importantly, state your position in the beginning. If you're here for A, B, X, Y, Z, state your position. Do you support or do you oppose? Because you don't want the staffer to leave the meeting and not really know or you forget or they don't really learn your position until the end of the meeting. So state right in the beginning. Uh, also, know the facts. Do your research. Become familiar with the bill. Become familiar with your subject area. Become familiar with your story. Uh, practice talking about it in the mirror. Practice sharing your story amongst your colleagues. So the better you under the better you are at telling the story, the better your advocacy approach will be. Uh, final, you want to conclude with questions. Get a feel for who the member is. Does the member, how does the member feel about this subject? Has the member voted on this before? So you want to ask certain questions to get a feel. Uh, and that'll give you more insight into your next meeting or future meetings. All of this comes down to a webinar activity. Yes, we are here. You get a chance to become an advocate because why? You are an advocate already. So what we'll have you do on this one is write a fact sheet or a support letter. We emailed you to we emailed you different examples of support letters and different examples of fact sheets. They both are going to take a little bit of research, and this is where you will go on the website that we went to earlier. Ledge info dot legislature dot ca dot gov and you want to submit this to the uh, webinar to google form in this make sure you have the organization you represent it can be a made-up organization for me i would more uh, appreciate if you found an organization there is a bunch of organizations you can actually even google policy organizations uh, Western Center for Poverty and Law, California Pan Ethnic Health Network, uh, even uh, Cal IHEA. Just choose an organization and then make sure that you know the mission and why you're representing this organization. Then you need to have the bill number and the author. I want you to go on Ledge Info and I want you to choose a bill that you want to write a fact sheet or a support letter for. Now this bill can be a current bill, this bill can be a bill that was uh, 
veto, a bill that passed, a bill that didn't pass, a bill that, you know, a good way to find a bill, you can even go on Ledge Info and then look it up by assembly member. So if you're, or a senator, if you're a member or senator of your district, is Senator Skinner for Berkeley, then you can actually go and look at her bill package and then choose one of those bills, or you can be specific and choose a bill that is in an area that you care about and is passionate about, because we want this to be fun for you. Then you want to make sure you write about how this bill will impact a specific community or population. This will go into the support letter or the fact sheet. You want to have at least one statistical fact at least one and make sure you cite your source then you want to write about why the members should vote for this bill and always always end by asking for an i vote so you're sort of still going to follow that same structure that we went over in the previous slide uh, and again you'll have examples so please check your email for that the due date for this is february 6 by the end of the day which would be 5 p.m Please submit this by 5 p.m. February 6th. And I just also want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for sitting through this webinar, engaging with us. I look forward to reading over your advocacy fact sheets and support letters. And stay tuned for the next webinar, which will be on February 7th by Health Policy Fellow Michelle Carrera, which will be on Medi-Cal and the Healthcare Safety Net. All right, thank you. You have a good one. Hope you all have a good weekend.